we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Seven years before these words were spoken, the University of Texas at Austin had opened its doors to the first African-American undergraduate students on campus. However, desegregation was marginal and African-American students enjoyed few freedoms as dormitories, student organizations, and nearby businesses remained segregated. Frustrated with such discrimination, African-American students took a stand against their unfair treatment. Although not evident at first, the student's stand for integration would extend far beyond the UT campus. Desegregated yet separate, standing together for integration. In 1956, the idea of desegregation was not new to the University of Texas. Ten years earlier, Human Marion Sweat applied to the university's law school, but was rejected. Despite meeting all the admission qualifications, he was denied solely on the basis of his race. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People represented Mr. Sweat and brought legal action against the university. The important thing about Sweat versus Painter is that it's in between Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, and then you have Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Sweat appealed to the lower courts here in Texas. They ruled against him and said pretty much that UT was right in denying him entrance to the university. Plessy versus Ferguson um, ruled that segregation was okay as long as you had separate or equal facilities. The separate law school was established in the basement of an off-campus building. Mr. Sweat received a letter of admission to the new school, but rejected the offer and stood firmly with the belief that the legal education would not be equal to that offered at UT. In 1950, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed with Sweat. The court did not yet denounce the separate but equal doctrine of Plessy, but recognized that the two schools were not equal. For one, the law school at UT boasted a much larger, more experienced faculty and a greater scope of books in its law library. Furthermore, its reputation, influential alumni, and prestige made it unequivocally superior. The court concluded with the unanimous vote that the two law schools were inherently unequal based on both tangible and intangible factors. Under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the University of Texas was now required to admit Sweat to its law school. Sweat's stand for desegregation formed the basis upon which the Supreme Court would overrule the Plessy decision in Brown v. Board of Education. The Brown ruling overturned the long-standing separate but equal doctrine and concluded that the segregation of educational facilities was inherently unequal. In 1955, UT's Board of Regents unanimously voted for the desegregation of campus classrooms. They had to abide by the law, but they also had alumni, they had students, they had parents of students who were very, very upset by what the university was planning on doing. They were very measured and very deliberate in how far they wanted to go. In 1956, the first black students arrived on UT's campus as undergraduate students. But they wanted them just to be students and to, to go. They did not want them to be integrated socially because there would be this race mixing. While the university opened its doors to these students, they were never truly welcomed. We studied and went to class, and that was about the size of it. We were not allowed to participate in any of the activities. We were not allowed to eat on the drag or the uh, cafeteria. It was closed on the weekends, so we had to make provisions to eat elsewhere. And then on occasions, you would walk on campus and you would hear the N-word being expressed. And uh, so people were uncomfortable around it. They refused to sit by me. Uh, if there were a seat vacant, they'd go elsewhere. And uh, if I sat anywhere near them, they'd get up and move, so. Unspoken rules would continue the segregation of African-American students. In some areas of the campus, these students could not use whites-only bathrooms or drinking fountains. Students were denied participation in athletic programs, particularly because sports often represented the public face of UT, and the Board of Regents worried that African-American athletes would upset some members of the white community. These first African-American undergraduates found that their dorms were overcrowded, run down, unair-conditioned, or far from campus. In 56, the only places, only place for uh, African-American men were Sanders and the dormitories, which were World War II barracks, and there were two set aside for men. Mrs. Duran had to just make a room in the door 
because I was riding the bus, two buses to get to an eight o'clock class. And the room was a porch. It wasn't an enclosed room. And I called it a room with a view. <laughs> the unwritten segregation rules made their way into student organizations such as band, orchestra, choir, and theater. In 1957, Barbara Smith became the focus of a controversial dispute when despite having the best voice, she was denied the lead role in a student opera because of her skin color. Well, she was playing opposite a white singer or a white, I mean, they said a white boy. That was the problem. The fact that it showed an interracial couple on the stage at UT, the legislature threatened to pull funding to the university if they didn't take her out of that production. UT had opened its doors to African American students, but it was made clear that integration would be restricted to the classroom. While the Board of Regents maintained segregationist policy, some white faculty and students joined the fight for integration. African American and white students began participating in pickets and sit ins on campus. The student newspaper, The Daily Texan, published articles and letters in support of complete and expedited integration. UT Austin could not be truly integrated until the drag, an area of shops surrounding campus, became accessible to all customers. Students began organizing sit-ins at restaurants and stand-ins at movie theaters with the hope that persistence would allow their voices to be heard. I do remember that his service station on the drag was, did not serve blacks. And so we demonstrated there and but it was a daily occurrence, you know, that every day after class, and I would be up there from noon to five. Oh, I participated in stand-ins on the drag to go to the movie. We just stood in line and we had some comments. It wasn't pleasant. Assignments were given by various professors to see movies. Of course, the African-American students were not allowed to go to the, go to the uh, movies. In 1962, African-American students at UT extended an invitation to civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr to visit and encourage complete integration of the campus. King spoke at the Texas Union and pronounced, Old man segregation is on his deathbed. The only question is how expensive the South is going to make the funeral. Continued demonstrations enabled African American students to tackle another problem at hand, the integration of athletics. As protests continued, African Americans saw their first victory. Frank C. Irwin Jr., a new member of the Board of Regents, kept his promise to begin desegregation of the athletic program. Following this success, integration encompassed most sports by 1963. However, it wouldn't be until 1970 that African Americans would finally begin participating in the South's most prestigious sport, football. African Americans also began to take a stand for integrated living accommodations. After student sit-ins at dorms such as the Women's King Solving Hall, it became clear that change was necessary. In May of 1964, after continuous student and faculty demonstrations, the Board of Regents finally relented. In a 6-1 to one vote, the Board agreed to complete the integration of all UT facilities, removing the last vestiges of segregation from campus. The students had attained their goal, but not without cost. They faced vicious verbal and physical intimidation, demoralizing ostracism, racist peers, and even a bombing. Three months later, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, thereby outlawing discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Old man segregation was dead at last. Eamon Sweat's sacrifices impacted Texas by enabling African American graduate students to attend the University of Texas and the nation by laying the foundation for the Brown decision. This historic ruling opened UT's doors to its first African-American undergraduates, who then continued Sweat's struggle by taking a stand for complete integration of all campus facilities. These first students went on to work as teachers, scientists, military officers, architects, lawyers, and more, enriching Texas and the nation with their contributions. Today, those early African-American students are united as the precursors, standing together to share their experiences, remember the progress, and support current African-American students, as well as UT's continuing efforts to bring diversity to the 40 acres. Their determination and resilience has led the University of Texas to become more diversified and inclusive than ever. This is their story. What started here changed the nation. <laughs>